You didn't mark anything wrong, but you got. Well, there was a bonus question. Is it only worth seven points? Well, it's uh, it's out of fourteen problems, so it was actually out of yeah fourteen. So I counted this worth ten. So that means you got a hundred fifty out of a hundred forty. So it's not ten points; like it goes to a hundred ten. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So th this was weighted the same as every problem. Right. So you have, the most you get was 150 out of 140. I'm going to help you out a little bit on this second one. That's the easiest way to look at the second one right there. Anybody having trouble? Want me to come by and help them? There's no shame in asking for help. Who's done with all three? Okay. Just give you a few more minutes. I'm going to pass around the sign-in sheet. Are you all ready to talk about this? Yes? How about the first one? Any, any questions or have, anyone having any issues on the first one? You're all okay? Okay, what about the second one? What's, what's hanging you up on the second one? The second part? Yeah. Okay, look at this first part is a constant times a function, right? So the constant is going to come for the ride. And then I need to take derivative of x, which is 1. So it's just going to be root 3 times 1. Now, the other part, root of 3x, can be split up, can't it? Yes. Root 3 is a constant, so it's just going to come for the ride. So that's this root 3. Well, let me write it if I were taking derivative. If I were taking derivative of this, here's what I would do. Root 3 would come for the ride. Then I'd say times. Now I need the derivative of root x, which is the one that I need you to memorize. It's 1 over 2 root x. Right? And that's it. Then you can just slide this root 3 up top, and you're here. It's a lot easier when I do it, right? I mean, it's just clean. That's the cleanest way, I think, to do that one. How about the last one? Any trouble here? Pi is, uh, pi is a constant, right? So it just comes for the ride, so I'm just going to ignore it. What's derivative of tangent of u? Secant squared u, and I just slap the pi on, on the front. 
Questions? May I, may I continue or do we, have, do we need to review that anymore? I'm going to give you something a little different. All right, how about this? If f of x equals cosine x, find this. That means the 99th derivative. So do you really think I want you to take the derivative 99 times? I don't. I don't, right? But let's just see what happens if we take the first few derivatives. All right, so how about we write some things down? <clears throat> if I take the 0 derivative, that's just cosine x. Do you, does that make sense, that notation? Mm -hmm. The zeroth derivative means don't take the derivative. And I get cosine. If I take the first derivative, what is the first derivative of cosine of x? It's negative sine x. How do you know that? Because I gave that formula to you just a second ago, right? OK, now let's take the second derivative, which means we, we need to take the derivative of this. So the second derivative, what about that negative out front? That negative out front is really like a negative 1, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And that means it's a constant, and that means it's coming for the ride. Mm -hmm. Yes? So that negative is going to continue down. And now I just take derivative of sine x. What's the derivative of sine x? Cosine. cosine x. So I put that here. So I started out, no derivative, I'm at cosine. First derivative, negative sine x. Second derivative, I'm at negative cosine x. Now let's take the third derivative. The third derivative, again, the negative is going to come for the ride, isn't it? Negative times, now what is the derivative of cosine x? Negative sine, negative sine x. So I have negative negative, which is just sine x, right? Now let's take the fourth derivative. And where are we? Cosine x? And aren't we back now to where we started? So when I do the fifth derivative, I'm going to get this one. And when I take the sixth derivative, I'm going to get this one. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. See, this is what we call a cyclic function. It's, it's cyclic. It starts to, it has a cycle, OK? So the cycle is cosine, negative sine, negative cosine, sine. Then it repeats, cosine, negative sine, negative cosine, sine. And that's what it would keep doing. So we just need to figure out um, how we could do this. Like, so this, this is the same answer we get for what? The fourth derivative? Which other one? What other derivative would we get that? So this is like, if this was the fourth, this would be the fifth, sixth, seventh. So it would also be the eighth derivative, wouldn't it? This would be the eighth derivative the twelfth derivative, right? And keep going, right? Well, the 99th derivative is not there because those are all even numbers. Yes? Okay, what about this one? This is the first derivative. Second, third, fourth, right? Let me, let me, let me get this one out of here. So this is zero derivative, first, second, third. That's the same as the fourth. This would be the same as the fifth. So this would be the same as the fifth derivative and the I've heard I've heard 10 and 7 let's count again this is going to be 0 first second third fourth fifth sixth seven eight ninth derivative right and what's happening they just keep on going up by how much each time 4 so this will also be the 13th derivative, and so on and so forth. What about this one? This is the second derivative, but it's also the sixth derivative. The 
tenth derivative, fourteenth derivative, right? So on and so forth. So it's not here, right? It might be here. I, I kind of stopped, but it might be there, it might be here. Let's let's try this one. This is the same as the what, the third derivative and then the seventh derivative? The eleventh derivative? the 15th derivative, and so on and so forth. So really, you just need to figure out, is, is 99 in this list, or is 99 in this list, uh, this list? Which list is it in? So this brings up an even, even deeper, more profound question. Is there a way? that you can, you can think about these numbers kind of from a different perspective. This was first, fifth, ninth, thirteenth, right? Let me, let me list that out. This list right here was the first derivative, fifth, ninth, thirteenth, and so on, right? This list right here was the third derivative, seventh, eleventh, fifteenth, and so on and so forth. Do you all understand? I'm trying to figure out if 99, which of those 99 is in? So you could just like figure it out. You could like count it out if you want. And maybe you see a pattern, you would, you would establish it. But, but is there a, a, a different way to approach it? So how about this? What we want to know is if we can generate, can, can you come up with a formula that would generate these lists? So I'm going to give you the formula. Let's see if, if it makes sense to you. What if I say that this list is the same as 1 plus 4n? Okay, so n here is any, or I'll say an integer. And let's say positive integer. So um, what if n is 1? If n is 1, what does this become? What if n is 2? 9. What if n is 3? 13. So how did I come up with this formula? Well, what I said was, where does the formula start at? And how much does it jump each time? Four. By 4. So this will start at 1 and jump by multiples of 4 each time. What would the formula for this one be? 3 plus 4n. Do you all see where I came up with those? You sure? Now, if I can come up with that formula, those formulas, then what I'm asking myself now is this. Is 1 plus 4n equal to 99? Is there an n that's going to spit out 99 here? Or does it come from this formula? Right? That's what I want to know. So let's try this. Solve for n. So subtract 1 from both sides, and you would get 4n equals 98. And how many times does 4 go into 98? It's not an integer, right? It's a decimal. Doesn't go in evenly. But I said n had to be an integer. One, two, three, four. So it can't come from this list. How about here? Subtract three from both sides. You get 96. And how many times does four go into 96? 24 times. Exactly 24. So it's got to come from this list. Which means that it, which list was that? The last one? So that means it came from this one right here. This is our winner. This one's our winner right here. So the 99th derivative of that is, is sine x. Hmm. So if I, if I change this, right, from 99 to like 9,903, right? You could, you could do the exact same thing, except when you, you get to here, you put 9903, 9903, and you'd figure out which of these is going to give you an integer answer. That's an interesting problem. In your homework, you're asked to find the 99th derivative of sine. So I didn't just like pull that problem out of the air. It's actually in the book, too. How are y'all feeling today? Y'all all right? Happy Valentine's Day. You feel the love? 
I have such a great joke that I want to tell, but I can't. It's highly inappropriate. My wife verified with me this morning that I cannot tell the joke. It's a good Valentine's Day joke, though. Oh, well. I can't. It's inappropriate in every respect. <laughs> I, I'm not going to tell it at all. <laughs> all right. Um, there are some homework problems where they give you a function and they ask, they ask you to find the equation of the tangent line. All right? So that means that you have to find the slope of the tangent line and then you have to use the point slope formula. I'm not giving you an example of that today because we've done that already. We found equations of tangent lines. The big difference is now when you go to take the derivative, you don't have to use the limit anymore. You use the formulas. Okay, so when you do the homework, just be expecting a few problems that I didn't demonstrate today. All right? We're going to move on to the product and quotient rules now. Our rules up to this point have been straightforward. The next two are not. Okay, what did I say? The next two are not what we would hope for or expect. All right, so that's it for today. Y'all have a good day. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Okay. Let me put, in, let me put the example on the board first, okay? So let's, let's look at this. As an example, let's say we're trying to take the derivative of this function x squared times sine x. Okay? I'm going to do something here. I'm going to graph this, if my computer allows me to. There it is. It's a rather good looking function, isn't it? Yeah? I like that function. It's kind of crazy looking. All right, so let's talk about the derivative. If we're going to go and try and find the slope of the tangent line somewhere, right? We would need to take that derivative. Our instinct might tell us, well, I know the derivative of x squared, and I know the derivative of sine. So maybe, maybe the derivative of this is 2x times cosine x. Maybe, maybe, right? That would be nice if it was. Let me graph that one, okay? Let me graph the derivative for you. 2x times cosine x, and then you're going to tell me whether or not that is or not. So how could we check? How about we just pick this point right here on the original function? What should the slope of the tangent line be there? Zero. That means the blue curve should be at zero, is it? No. no. Hmm. How about here? I should have a slope of zero, do I? Blue curve's not even near it. Let's pick something else. Um, well. At zero here? Yeah, what's the slope of the tangent line here? It's going to be positive, isn't it? Oh, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. I'm on the wrong graph. I'm on the wrong graph. I'm looking at the red graph. If you look at the red graph, the slope of the tangent line there should be zero, right? But the, oh, and the derivative is zero, isn't it? The blue one goes through there. So that matches, right, at one point. But it doesn't match here, and it doesn't match there. Um, I could even go here, look, if I go to this point right here on the, on, wait, I'm on the red, I keep on forgetting which one I'm on. Um, let me zoom out, let me zoom out a little bit. Look, as soon as, eh, it's too crazy, let's, let's not, let's not. I thought we had another one over there. 
Yeah, look, as soon as we have a few points that don't match, we should be pretty confident that this is, that's not correct. Yeah. All right? Because it's got to match everywhere. So is that enough, I guess, for you to believe that that derivative is not this? Okay. So that means that taking the derivative of that is going to be somewhat problematic. And it's going to require a new rule. So this right here is a no-go right here. If you have a product, do you all see that product there? A product happening between two functions of x? If you have a product and you try and take the derivative, you cannot just take the derivative individually. If you have a product between two functions and you go to take the derivative, you cannot just take derivative of each. If you have a product between two functions, you cannot just take the derivative of each one. It's three times I've told you that. If that were the case, calculus one would be a lot easier than it is, honestly. This is one of the things that really makes this class hard. And when we get to division, it's even uglier, the formula we have to use. So I have about 23 minutes. We're going to answer this question. But um, to, I'm trying, debating right now whether or not I should prove the formula to you or just give it to you and let you use it. So what do you all think? You don't want to see it proven? Okay, let me give you the formula first, all right? And then I'm going to prove the formula. So here's a formula. If, if, whoa, if you have f of x times g of x, all right? Then the derivative of this with respect to x, I'm using a slightly different notation here. The derivative of this is equal to the derivative of the f function times the g function plus the derivative of the g function times the f function. Okay, I'm gonna, I really have to make sure you, you know where the parentheses and stuff are here. What you're gonna do, these are separated. In order to take the derivative of a product of two functions, you must take the derivative of the first function. Figure out what its derivative is. And then multiply that answer by the second function without a derivative. Then add to that the derivative of the second function times the first function without a derivative. So again, it's like the derivative takes turns. First the derivative hits the first function, doesn't hit the second one. Then you do plus, now it hits the second one and not the first one. See that? Sure? Now I, I, I want to prove that to you, but you know what? 15 minutes. Let me, do, let me do a couple of examples, huh? Shouldn't they be in parentheses then? What then? Plus, like at the first part, and then plus the second Like all of this? Yeah. All of this in parentheses? Yeah. You don't have to. Because order of operations would say that this multiplication takes place before that addition, and this multiplication would take place before the addition. But if it makes you feel better, I mean, you can, <laughs> it's not incorrect to throw parentheses around that. That's, okay, so that's the formula. Let me show you a different version of the same formula. Okay, so like, if I want to write this a different way, if you have f times g, and you want their derivative, then it's f prime g plus g prime f. Do you all see that that's the same formula as that one? This is the notation I'm going to use right here. The derivative of f times g is f prime g plus g prime f. Now, when I first presented this to you, this is what I was, we were saying question mark. Was this true, right? Was it just derivative of each one separately? I mean, you know, individually just do them and then put them together and multiply them. And the answer was no, right? 
So this is what that formula would have looked like had it been that question mark case. Unfortunately, it's not. This is it. You have to memorize that. So let's go back to, let's go back to that example. I will prove it to you. I'll, I'll try and do it today. Let's go back to that example that I had. f of x was x squared sine x, right? OK, so when you look at this, you first must realize that you have a product, all right? You have to realize you have a product. And therefore, you must employ the product rule. So I like to highlight the product by putting a dot and putting a dotted line between them to illustrate I've got two functions that are being multiplied together. I even like to label them. I like to call this first guy right here, I like to call him f and this one g. Even if the original function is called f already, I will still call this f and g just so I'm thinking in terms of the formula. I've got two things multiplied, right? So the derivative of this should be the derivative of the first one, right? I'm going to take derivative of the first one times the second one plus the derivative of the second one times the first one. Do you all see that that's f prime g plus g prime f? And what is the derivative of x squared? So I'm ready to start calculating this. The derivative of x squared is 2x times sine x. And then over here, derivative of sine x. So cosine x times x squared. Is this x cubed? No, that x is trapped inside the cosine. This one's not. So it would probably be better for me to write 2x sine x plus x squared cosine x. There we go. Probably be better for me to write that. Now I'm going to go back to the uh, computer and I'm going to ask it to graph that. So I'm going to get rid of this one and instead I'm going to put 2x sine x plus x squared times cosine x. And let me, let me zoom in on this. We got too much junk going on there. Let's just investigate it right here. Let's look at the red one. Here, slope of tangent line is zero. What's the blue one doing there? It's zero. Um, red one right here, slope of tangent line is zero. What's the blue one doing there? It's zero. Right here, the slope is uh, positive, right? Positive, positive, it gets to kind of a highest point, it starts tilting back to zero, and then it flattens out. Zero, positive slope, goes up to zero. Yes? Or it comes up, comes back down. I, didn't, I did that kind of fast. So it goes up, I've got a positive slope, still positive but getting smaller because it's tilting back, it's, it's doing this. So it comes back and then when I get to the top, I'm at, I'm at zero. So hopefully that convinces you that that blue one is the derivative. Now the proof, and this will be it. 10 minutes. I don't know if I can do it in 10 minutes. All right, so let me start off with this. I have, here's what I have to do. If I have a function f of x times g of x, and let's call this capital F of x. And I want to find the derivative, f prime, capital F prime of x. I need to take the limit as h goes to 0 of capital F of x plus h minus capital F of x all over h. So what I'm trying to do is I'm defining a function, capital F, to be the product of two functions, little f and little g. And so the derivative of capital F is this formula. Do you all agree with that formula? Yes? Now, this is equal to limit h goes to 0. Now, capital F of x plus h means I'm going to replace this with x plus h, which means replace that and that with x plus h. So we get little f of x plus h times little g of x plus h. That's the top left. And then minus capital F of x, which is just little f of x times g of x. 
Is this worth me going through? I mean, are y'all really wanting to see this? I don't mind showing it. What? Okay, all right, all right. Because there is something actually very, very nice that, that, um, that you do to make this work, okay? Because you don't even know what F and G are, right? You don't even know what they are. So you can't like start doing like that cosine formula where we split it up. You can't do any of that. You can't distribute the F through. That's insane to do that, right? You can't. You're not allowed. So what you're going to do here, and this is something, again, that somebody else suffered through. Okay, we're just going to reap the benefits of their suffering here. All right. In mathematics, there is there are two really uh, big things that we do that are pretty profound. One of them we, you've done a lot, which is you've you've always like you've multiplied things by one. Multiplying things by one, you've always like multiplied top and bottom by the same thing, right? Like conjugate, top bottom. You've always employed that multiplying by one, even getting common denominators. That's what you're doing, right? So realizing that next to anything, if I have anything sitting here, that next to it there's always a one and I can always rewrite that one however I want, is a pretty deep idea in mathematics. But we've been using it so long, we don't appreciate it as much as we should. There's another thing that in mathematics that's, that's profound, but it's even deeper than this. And it's instead of thinking about multiplication, it's, it's using addition and subtraction. And that's that next to anything is a plus zero. So if I have something sitting here, I can always add nothing to it and it's still the same thing, right? So what I'm going to do is right here in the middle, I'm going to add a zero. I'm about to add a zero. Don't write this down. But that's what I'm about to add into this is a zero. And here's what that zero is going to be. You ready for this? The zero is going to be nuts. It's going to be f of x times g of x plus h minus f of x times g of x plus h. I don't like the way that's squeezed in there. Okay, plus f of x times g of x plus h minus f of x times g of x plus h. Okay, do you agree with me that that's zero? Right, because I'm adding something and then I'm taking it away. Now, would you have ever come up with this on your own? No, probably not, okay? But just agree with me that this is, this is still adding zero and so I haven't changed the problem. But by doing it and picking it that way, something very, very awesome is about to happen. All right, here it comes. Um, I'm going to put this guy right here and this guy right here together by themselves over H. And then I'm going to take this guy right here and put it together with this guy right here and put that over H. So I'm going to create two separate fractions from this. The first one is limit H goes to zero. Let's see, I'm going to do F of X plus H, G of X plus H, and then I'm grouping that together with this one. So it's minus F of X, g of x plus h, all of that over h. Y'all okay with me doing that? Taking this one and this one, putting them over h. And then I'm going to separate this plus, I'm going to do a separate limit, h goes to zero. And now I'm going to take this one and this one, all right? So that'll be f of x, g of x plus h, minus f of x, g of x all of that over H. Y'all there? Still, still with me? Still awake? Okay. What an incredible way to attack this thing, to come in here with something like that. This equals. Now, on this first limit, I want you to notice that there's um, they both have, both the numerator uh, terms, both have a g of x plus h in them, don't they? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to factor it out and just slap it right in front here. So I'm going to have limit 
as h goes to 0, I'm going to have the g of x plus h that I pulled out times, and then what's left when I do that? When I pull the g of x plus h out of both of those, what's left? I'm going to, I'm going to have a fraction. What's it going to be? It's going to be f of x plus h. What? Minus f of x all over h. All right, that's what would happen. Okay, hang tight. Plus, now the second limit, what do both of these have in common? An f of x. So I'm going to pull that out in front. And then what would I be left with here? g of x plus h minus g of x all over h, right? We are there. I'm ready to let h go to 0. OK, let's let h go to 0. If h goes to 0, what does this piece right here become? g of x, right? OK, that's g of x. All right, what does this become? If I tell you to take the limit as h goes to 0 of this, it is 0 of 0, but think about it more abstractly. What is that formula? This limit of that thing, what is that? That's the derivative of f, isn't it? If I take this difference quotient and take its limit, that is how we define the derivative of f. So this piece with the limit is f prime of x, isn't it? Then I have plus. Now let h go to 0 here. Well, there is no h. So that's just f of x. And then now, what is this when I apply the limit to that? That's the derivative of g. That's g prime. And that means that the derivative of a product is equal to g times f prime plus f times g prime. Now, remember, multiplication doesn't matter, right? Like how you arrange things. That's not the way I gave you the formula. My formula said this. My formula said f prime times g plus g prime times f, right? That's the formula I gave you. This is that, right? Because you could just flip these, and that's this. And you could just flip those, and that's this, right? So that's it. That's the proof. It requires that hidden 0, though. Not very, in, not very uh, easy to get to that hidden zero. All right, so for your um, weekend, make sure you do the homework for power rule. Make sure you're caught up on everything else. Please anticipate a quiz sometime next week. All right. Everybody signed in. Anybody need to pick up their test? Where are they? There's some extra. Okay, there's a test right here. If you uh, didn't get yours. Let me get the camera turned off real quick. Are you looking for the test? No. Oh, sign in? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs>